Okay. So we're talking about the three P's, which is practice, performance, and play. And that we need to get in seclusion to do the practice. That the Buddha had a, um, he's got an analogy. And uh, the way that this analogy is announced is very strange because the Buddha said that this analogy is absolutely original. This is one that he came up with, which indicates that much of what the Buddha taught, uh, he, he learned from somewhere else. Uh, an example of that would be the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths did not come from the Buddha himself. It comes from Ayurvedic medicine. With the illness, the cause of the illness, uh, the, uh, the result of the cure, and the cure. And so this is an old way of looking at it. But the analogy that he says that he came up with, I call the log in the bog or a tree trunk that's fallen, maybe a cypress has fallen into the swamp. Now, in the time of the Buddha, they had fire, professional fire makers. Nowadays, fire is really easy for anyone. You know, all you need is a lighter or a fight chat, electric, gas, anything. But in the time of the Buddha, getting a fire started was quite a feat. And so, can a fireman a professional fire maker, can he go into that bog and set that log on fire? That's the question. Can he? Can he set that log on fire if it's in the bog? Are you asking me? I'm asking. <laughs> um, probably not. Probably not. Why? Because the log is saturated with water. Yeah. If he drags the log out of the bog and puts it up on the beach or on the shore or on the dry land, can the fireman then set the log on fire? Oh, um, probably not. Well, not right away. Not eventually. right away, precisely. That's exactly the answer. Even if you remove it out of the bog immediately, it still can't be set on fire. It needs to dry out a bit. Okay. This is what we're meaning then by practice. Just like little Johnny does not want an audience while he's practicing the piano. He doesn't want a piano uh, uh, audience when he's actually practicing. What he wants is seclusion. So he can go over it, over it and over it again so that he can get it down correctly. Only later is he willing to go out into public and perform. So is the same way with our meditation practice that we want to get into seclusion. In fact, that's the whole intention of a retreat. But it's got a kind of a catch-22 built into it. How can you have 100 people coming to do a retreat and expect every one of them to be in seclusion? It's not easy to do. But in fact, that's um, uh, in the Anapanasati <clears throat> Sutta, there is no place in that sutta which says um, go to a big established meditation center for a retreat. <laughs> no. What does it say? It says go to an empty hut or to a tree in the forest or into a remote area. And uh, like uh, at uh, the, the music school, um, they have Practice little room. private rooms, okay, to, for the students to go in and, and uh, practice. Practice is done in seclusion. Yes, <laughs> I've done and, and, a lot of, a lot of, <clears throat> I've been in, <clears throat> spent a lot of time in practice rooms in my life. Okay, 
Um, <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, this is how we look at it, is, is that we need to get in seclusion so that we can get the mind to dry out. Now, basically what that means then is in seclusion here <coughs> is in the realm of secluded, like the log is secluded from the bog. It's out of the bog. But then when the log begins to dry out, really what we're talking about is getting secluded from the water that's in the log. And, and that's impossible to do if the log is out in the bog. And so the, the meditation student then needs to get away from it all. But by getting away from it all, he is still completely saturated with the world. The mind is still in the world. Uh, so we bring the world in there. And so in that regard, it's really hard to get secluded. when we're bringing the world with us. Just like it's really hard for the log to become secluded from the, the bog, because when you take the log out, it brings the bog with it. <laughs> and it's only after the mind then becomes secluded from the hindrances is the real seclusion done. And that if we go back into the world, then we go right back into the bog. Right. All right. So what we need to learn how to do is, one, to get in seclusion, to get the mind cleaned out, or to get the mind free from the bog itself. And then we have to get the, the water or the bog that we brought it out with us also out. Now, there are many, many ways of looking at this and that a lot of it has to do with the kind of language that we have uh, in e the English language that we try to bring to Buddhism. Um, in, in Sutta number 19, the Buddha talks about two kinds of thought in the sense that there is wholesome thought and unwholesome thought. And basically what we can say is, is then the log represents the unwholesome. Because the log cannot be set on fire at all. It's impossible because of the, uh, uh, let us say, the water itself is hindering the log from being set on fire. So if we are then able to get the mind cleaned out of the of the hindrances after we've gotten the mind away from the world that's when uh we can rejoice in the success of having removed the hindrances that basically we can see that uh the hindrances come up to the surface in the mind in this moment because there is underlying tendencies and that these underlying tendencies when they have an opportunity will come up well there's loads and loads of opportunity when we're out in the world for the hindrances to come up the whole world everybody you meet is probably in some form of hindrance in the moment why because no one uh, or let us say very few people that you'll meet on the street are happy and joyful. We're, we're hindered from being joyful. And that that has a lot to do with our society. That literally our society, Western society, makes people crazy. In psychology, they have a term called crazy maker. And what they mean by a crazy maker is normally the mother of a child, and the mother lies to the child. That will make a child crazy. And yet almost all mothers will lie to their children. But if it gets to the point where the mother is just constantly lying, then the children will wind up uh, confused about many things, because they don't know what's going on, because they keep getting lied to. Well. 
a lot of our society are people trying to defend themselves. They're trying to make up for mistakes. And a lot of that has to do with covering up and lying, which means that there's a lot of confusion that's built into that. Now, there's something else that we can look at, and that is looking at these underlying tendencies. Uh, that's actually the translation of the term. And it, if you look in Bhikkhu Bodhi's, uh, for instance, the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, he's got an index and um, underlying tendencies are there. And so I go flip through all of these suttas that's talking about underlying tendencies and finding out that when they're listing them, there's more than one list. That some things in one li uh, list are considered underlying tendencies and other things are not. What, are you what word are you defining as underlying tendencies? Actually, the correct word that I'm going to introduce to you is instincts. That we are born with instincts. And those instincts means that there is kind of a pre-programming that every child is born with, and that that programming then is developed. But it's not developed in a wholesome atmosphere, it's developed in a normal cultural atmosphere. Okay, so an example of that would be, let's look at the four hindrances, because the four, excuse me, the four, uh, known instincts that are normally listed as instincts. We have the instinct of self-preservation. That's the biggie. That's, in fact, the basis of all instinctual behavior is there something innate in each person that tries to keep us alive. An example of that is the anterior cortex of the brain keeps the heart pumping. In that same area uh, is the breathing mechanism. All of this is in the old reptilian brain that's in the back of the head, uh, uh, including the, um, the cerebellum and all of that part of the brain. And that it, uh, the primary function of that brain is to keep the whole organism alive. The secondary instincts that you can see in all, especially mammals, you can look at mammals because you know that uh, uh, the mammals, the top of the chain of the mammals are the great apes and that we're part of that class. <laughs> if I call you an ape, I'm being um, uh, not unkind. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what we're, we are. So... Um, these instincts um, really, really, um, let us say, color and influence our behavior, and it influences our behavior on a mass scale so that our culture is actually built up upon instincts. One of those instincts is normally called the propious uh, not proprioceptic, uh, procreation instinct. But if you look at the word, you see, immediately when the Westerner hears that word, they think sex. But that's not what the, the whole thing is. You no, know, what, what the, propria, uh, the procreation instinct, if you think about the word procreation, that means to make something or to gather something. And that the primary way that we uh, operate instinctually is by gathering material possessions around us. We can go to the very first time that that happened, and I imagine that the first thing that happened was is that a human picked up a stick, <laughs> that the other end of the stick was on fire, and he wanted to keep that fire. The other possibility is, is that the human is there trying to get the marrow out of the bones of the carcass that the uh, predators left. And so he grabs a rock and he starts beating on that uh, uh, marrow to get the marrow out of the bone. Okay. 
and he runs across the rock that he actually likes. This is a good rock. Maybe it's got sharpness to it or something, and he finds a way of doing it. So unlike your normal uh, creatures, and there's a lot of animals that use tools, one would be the otter, who will go down and get the clamshells and a rock. He'll come back up to the surface, and he'll swim uh, laying on his back in the water, put that clam on his stomach, and bang it with a rock. Did you know that the otters would do that? No. Okay. There's another example, and that is that monkeys know how to get worms out of holes. And that is by putting a reed down in it and wait for the worm to start eating. And then they jiggle it a little bit, and then the worm really grabs a hold of that thing, and then they pull it out. And now the monkey's got a worm. When he eats the worm, what does he do with that reed? He throws it away. What does the otter do? with that rock once he gets the shell open. He discards it. He doesn't have any use for it. It's humans that keep things. One could go so far as to say the reason that our hand developed the way that it was is because before the hands were developed this way, the animals at that time still wanted to hold something and carry it around. And so our whole quality of materialism is actually built on instinct. Why? Because we think we need our tools, we think we need our uh, possessions to make our lives easy and safe. Hence, weapons. So the first thing he did was he grabbed a rock. Next, you know, millennia later, they're tying a stick to the rock and, an, and, and having an axe, right? Fast forward a few hundred thousand years, and now what do we have? We have the cell phone. And people carry the cell phone around for protection. I've even seen people on Reddit say, well, I don't, I'm not afraid to go into that store because I know I've got my cell phone and I can call 911 if there's any trouble. Now, that's pretty stupid. If there's actually going to be trouble, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to grab that cell phone <laughs> and you don't have it for protection anymore. So, these instincts, the next instinct is what we call the nesting instinct or the herding instinct. And that nesting instinct or the herding instinct is what we wind up using most of the time for social control. The, the nesting instinct means that uh, the animals at night will collect together in a, uh, in a tribe or in a, uh, a nest for protection through the night. But you can also see wildebeest and um, even sheep and a sheepdog. Modern day version of how can a dog that's at best not even as big as a sheep or a goat, how can that one dog, just by barking and, walk, and running around, herd all of those sheep, gather them together, and then march them through the gate, or take them to wherever he wants them to go? How can a dog do that? The answer is, number one, that the sheep were afraid of the dog, and number two, they instinctually herd together. Now, if one of those sheep or, or several of them could get together in a private conversation, let's just say all <laughs> of a sudden they have um, human instincts, they can say, you know, every one of us is bigger than that dog. Why don't the three of us go surround that dog and teach him a lesson so that nobody else has to go into that herd? Okay. Well, guess what? In our society... That barking dog is very common. And we, like sheep, will herd together. An example of that is a government or police. They're the barking dog. Another one are priests and preachers. There are other barking dogs. And, and us, with our instincts, will herd together and do what we're told, even if we don't like it. We'll do what we were told to do anyway. This is exactly how schools 
are used for humans is that no child wants to go to school. But we do it anyway. Why? Because of two things. Number one is because of fear, and number two is because of the instinctual behavior of, of for humans through that herding instinct is to do what we're told to do. Another one, the, the last one, which is uh, quite important, is called the territorial instinct. The territorial instinct for dogs, dogs know exactly where their territories are. In fact, uh, when they did the experiment, they decided that they were going to reintroduce wolves into the Yellowstone area because over the century, uh, all of the wolves had been killed out. The men didn't like the wolves because they would attack their domesticated animals or whatever. And so all the wolves were killed. That began to have its own problems. And so the uh, scientists reintroduced wolves and they did it using radio collars. 